stations to be uh, the anchors of the morning announcement. So if that's something that's really interesting to you and you would like to do that next year, you can take that ap application and then um, audition. But you would have to read. Oh, no, no. <laughs> right? Um, now what would we do? Right? So anyways, um, so this is chapter 28, 29, and 30 in your textbook, The American Pageant. And that begins a conversation about the progressive narrative. And so what you know the test is going to start with is um, a discussion about what that all means. What is progressivism? What is the progressive era? And what we said was this, that look, progressivism is this time period when a lot of people, beginning around the turn of the century, not exactly at the turn of the century, where a lot of different people became interested in pursuing a lot of different reforms and causes because they believed that um, the problems associated with industrialization and urbanization were so uh, profound that they threatened really kind of um, what they envisioned America to be. And so we said that progressivism is at the core a reform movement. It is not a comprehensive organized movement that has officers and, and you know a president and it, it's not necessarily a club. It's a lot of different people who were influenced to do a lot of different things around the same time that eventually kind of called themselves the progressives, right? I mean, we could, you could argue that both Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson were progressives in different ways. Now, we talked a little bit about, you know, what some of the elements of progressive reform was. And we said that really one of the big things about progressive reform is that the progressive reformers looked towards government, right? Okay, we see that there are problems in society. We see that the problems of the city and the problems of the factory are profound enough to protect, potentially threaten, right, what we consider to be Americanism, and we look to government to address these problems. So one of the things about progressivism is is that they looked towards government to address these problems. And in that sense, they hearken back to the populace. You know, we, we, we did this a little bit. We put progressivism in the middle of the board and we said, okay, where does the progressive impulse come from? Well, this idea of using government to address problems goes back to the populace. And the populace, you know, wanted the government to be an active agent to, to kind of do things. Another element of progressivism, an important element of progressivism, was efficiency. The progressives had a great confidence in efficiency, that government could make, be made to work, and that government could be made to work efficiently, and that government could be made to work for the people, and that they could address these problems using notions of scientific management and things of that nature. There is a, um, a mention in your textbook, and it might be a mention in your book, about a guy named Frederick Taylor. And Frederick Taylor was this guru of efficiency, breaking down tasks and then you know, analyzing them and addressing them in an efficient manner. Now, another element of progressivism was this idea of democracy giving the people some say so. And this is all related because, you know, look, you know, you're kind of saying, well, look, you know, we're looking to government to take action, to remedy problems in society, and we're looking to government to be efficient, but government on every level, as the progressives found, it was corrupt and inept. And so what, how to fix it? How do you fix government so it can be the agent of change in the progressive era? Well, you fix it by returning the power to the people breaking the power of the political bosses, you know? And so we talked a little bit about that. We said the catalysts of the progressive movement were the muckrakers. What did we mean by, what was muckraking? What, what did we mean by that? What was muckraking and what did we mean by that? Go ahead, Bob. Uh, um, it's like exposing the truth and like newspapers and magazines and stuff like investigation. Oh, so you're saying that muckraking was a form of journalism? Yeah. Tell me more about this form of journalism. They would like investigate uh, things in like society, and then so muckraking journalists would investigate what? Like meat, the meat industry, 
problems, yeah, problems in society, and then they would write exposés, exposing kind of the, 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 the sordid side of these problems, so that uh, people would be inspired to do something about it. And can you, can you identify or name somebody that was a muckraker? Any, any recollection? Yes. Ida Tarbell. Ida Tarbell, yes. Uh, Lincoln Steffens. Lincoln Steffens. And then we even said The Jungle might be considered a muckraking novel. What was The Jungle? We said, yes, go ahead. Yeah, it was a novel that was written. Who wrote that novel? Upton Sinclair, Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle in, in 1906, and it exposed all these terrible conditions in the meatpacking industry. And in response to that novel, people demanded some level of action, and government responded with the Meat, um, you know, meat Packing Act and the Pure Food, Food and Drug Act in 1906, which we said, on, uh, to some extent, was really the way that progressivism was intended to work. You know, the progressives, you know, were inspired by muckraking journalists and journalism to take action. They put, they put um, uh, pressure on government to pass legislation, to regulate, to fix, and then government responded. Now, um, in order for government to respond, it had to be under the control of the people and it had to be efficient. What was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire? What did, what did that have to do with uh, progressivism? And, yeah, go ahead, George. Uh, it sort of really brought out how terrible some working conditions were because they uh, locked all the safety escapes on like a fifth floor building or whatever when the place caught on fire. So the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was a, 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 a garment factory, and on the 10th floor, all these girls worked in you know this this factory and the doors were locked from the outside and there was a terrible fire and these girls were forced to leap to their death and this highlighted something that the progressives were interested in working conditions right which was an excess of um, industrialization and we and we did this you know when we talked about progressivism we talked about what progressivism was and then we talked about the muckrakers and how they had an influence in progressivism. And then we talked about the relationship between government and progressivism. And we talked about how the progressives tried to clean up government so they could use it. We talked about the Gal oh, we talked about something called the Galveston model. What was that all about? Uh, does anybody remember that? You know, the Galveston model, yes. I said well, they wanted to have professionals manage everything. Right. So the Galveston model was a city management model where they wanted professionals to manage, you know, city government trained professionals rather than political hacks, right? And we also talked about how the progressives tried to clean up state government with, some, with things like the referendum, the initiative, the recall, and those were things that were intended to give the power back to the people, right? But once we got done with all of those things, we said, okay, let's say the progressives have their way. Let's say that they put people into office that are responsive to the people and they make government more efficient. What were the things that they wanted to pursue, you know, on the state level? You know, this is the first thing we looked at. What kind of state laws did the progressives pursue? And one of the things they pursued were safety laws. The Tribal Shirt, uh, Waste, uh, shirt Waste Factory was an example of a stunning, terrible accident. And the progressives coming along and saying, look, we need to pass legislation to regulate you know, working conditions. And, you know, the working conditions of children, the working conditions of, of women, safety laws, you know, um, you know, um, um, you know uh, income security laws, welfare. You know, on the state level, these were some of the things that the progressives pushed for. They wanted government to be an agent for human, you know, benefit, right? And they pushed for various legislations that you should be familiar with. Now, when we kind of wrapped up the progressive era, we said, okay, you know, we talk about you know, city management and the progressives and cleaning up politics, but what about the national level? What about progressivism on the national level? When we started to talk about progressivism on the national level, we said this, that you could make an argument that Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson were all versions of progressivism, starting with with Theodore Roosevelt, who takes office in 1901. Now, you guys did an essay on Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, so you should have a familiarity with um, you know, both of these people and their political agenda and their, their domestic agenda and what they, what they aspire to. We know that Theodore Roosevelt is associated with a political agenda that he eventually called the Square Deal. 
And in, in doing so, Roosevelt said, I'm not for the rich man, I'm not for the poor man, I'm for the upright man, the square deal. And the embodiment of the square deal was Roosevelt's intervention in the anthracite coal strike of 1902. Let me ask you a question. Did Theodore Roosevelt send troops into the coal mines in 1902? Yes or no? No. He threatened to send troops. So many of you on your essay said, oh yes, in 1902, Theodore Roosevelt used the army to mine the coal. No, he didn't. What, did Ro what was Roosevelt's role in the coal strike? Remember, the coal miners went on strike. They refused to go back. The coal owners refused to talk to him. Country's running out of coal. What does Roosevelt do that he defines as the square deal? What's his role? What does he do in the anthracite coal, coal strike? Yes. Yes, he mediates. He calls both sides together. And when the, the owners seem reluctant to participate in that mediation, then what does he do? Well, he doesn't send in the military. He threatens to send in the military. What was significant about you're going to get this question right into that? Okay. What was significant about Roosevelt's role in this? So he threatens to use the military, but. Government had used the military had actually used the military in the past. Why was Roosevelt threatening to use a military in this situation different? Yes. Um, to use or threatened to use troops against business, right? So he intervened not necessarily on behalf of of labor or not necessarily on behalf of business, but in his mind on behalf of the public and that both sides had received a square deal. Hey, what was the Northern Securities case? Well, you know, we said the Northern Securities Company, the Northern Securities case. What was Roosevelt's role in the Northern Securities case, the Northern Securities Company? Does anyone besides the instructor remember? Camden, you were on a hot streak, as it were. Go ahead, Dr. Camden. He took down a large railroad. No, he said he took it down. What did he do? He took Well, how so? Say, say how so. He is right. Go ahead, Taylor. He ordered the Justice Department to file an antitrust suit against um, the Northern Securities Company. What was the antitrust law that was invoked there? What was the antitrust law that was invoked? Say it, say it, say it. Sherman, Sherman Antitrust Act, 1892. How had the Sherman Antitrust Act been used before that? It had not. It was intended to be used to break up strikes, but that's not how it was used. How was it used, dear Yakutich? How did they use the, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act? How did they use it in the Pullman strike to do what? To break strikes, right? They used it to break strikes to issue an injunction, arguing the union was restraining trade in the Pullman strike. Was that the intent of the Sherman Antitrust Act? Not really. And Roosevelt utilizes that legislation to actually break up the Northern Securities Company. But but, Alex, he did not think that big trust monopolies were necessarily a bad thing. So how could he justify breaking up the Northern Securities Company if he didn't think that a trust was a bad thing? Explain that, dear Alex. Uh, yeah. uh, go ahead, Sam. He is your close personal swimming friend, so you would know. Uh, he said that uh, he didn't mind the trusts as long as they had good so then having big business was not necessarily negative. Having business combinations and trust that limit competition was not nearly um, necessarily negative, right? What was bad is if they were irresponsible. And so what did he believe the government's role with trust should be? And many of you mentioned this, Matt, many of you mentioned this in your paper. Go ahead. Like regulate them? To regulate, not break them up, right? It's interesting, when I was reading your papers, how you would try to argue that somehow Roosevelt regulating trusts was either conservative and liberal, and Wilson wanting to break them up was the same thing, right? Now, I'm not saying that you can't do that, but I'm saying it's kind of a hard argument to make. You know, on one side, you have a Roosevelt saying, why look, I think business combinations are an inevitability of modern capitalism, but they must behave. And what we need is a powerful national government to regulate them and make sure that they behave. And what Wilson said is, look, I think business combinations are bad. And I think they should be broken up and competition should be restored. Now, it was interesting to see how you tried to say, well, both of those things were conservative. Right? I mean, it, it, it's not necessarily something that's impossible. 
but it is something that's, that's hard to do, or both of those things was, were liberal, you know. It, 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 it is kind of hard to do, because there were two dramatically different approaches. I think you could do it, you know, and maybe some of them did, I don't know. Now, um, um, in the Roosevelt administration, he pushed for something called the Elkins Act and the Hepburn Act. What industry did those two pieces of legislation affect? Does anyone besides, yes, go ahead then, the railroad industry. Railroads were still a very big deal. There were still abuses. And what did they involve? Lillian, do you remember what the, the Elkins and Hepburn Act involved? Well, they involved, you know, maximum rates. They involved rebates. They involved free passes, abuses that the railroads were perpetuating. And Roosevelt pushed for legislation to limit these abuses, again, regulating. Now, Roosevelt, you know, I, I mean, your textbook argued this, that if we look at Roosevelt's domestic product, it is the three C's, right? Um, corporations, which he wanted to regulate for the public good. Consumerism, where he wanted to protect consumers, like with the uh, Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act, and most significantly, conservation. Now, it's, other, it's also of interest to me how, on your papers that I'm reading, you tried to argue what conservation was. What was Roosevelt's you know, actions in conservation? We said, look, he was a conservationist. What Roosevelt wanted to do, he loved the great outdoors. He wanted the national government to manage the natural environment for the good of the people in the long run. And this involved the government setting aside land, regulating land use, and making sure generally that um, the, the public were good stewards of the natural environment. We compared that to being, you know, an environmentalist and an environmentalist. Who was the guy that we said founded the Sierra Club that was associated with the environmental movement? Does anyone besides Kromka and myself remember? Kromka, do you remember? Son of a gun, Kromka. Matt, do you remember? Oh my goodness, yes, John Muir, right, who followed in the Sierra Club, and he was a preservationist. And, and who was the guy that we said that was the chief forester for the Department of Agriculture? Yes. Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot. I'll tell you an interesting thing, Alex. Are you ready for an interesting thing? I'm ready. Gifford Pinchot eventually became the governor of Pennsylvania. Once governor of Pennsylvania, it was Gifford Pinchot that established the state store system in Pennsylvania where alcohol is sold by state-run stores, right, which is really controversial today, you know, in Pennsylvania, whether that should continue. It was Gifford Pinchot that, um, that established I want you kids to share that around the family table this evening while you're dining around the, and passing, you know, the, the Brussels sprouts, right? You might want to share that with the family so that they think that public education has some value there, right? So, so all right, um, we talked about conservation. Like I said, I, I found it interesting how people kind of struggle to say, what is conservation? Is it liberal or conservative? And, you know, some people would say, well, it's conservative because it's conservation, right? That's really not a good argument. You know, I mean, it's like really close to the word, you know, conservative, you know, conserve, conservation. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that, that probably is a better way to approach that. Um, so, but it is significant about Roosevelt that he supported this, this version of conservation. And we talked about the Newlands Act and preserving and setting aside and using the bully pulpit, which is kind of the, 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 the voice of the president to encourage, you know, sensible use of the natural environment. And so he puts the power and the prestige of the presidency behind conservation. Now, in 18, or 1908, Roosevelt could have easily won re-election, but he chose not to run. And in doing so, he was influential enough to choose his successor, and his successor was William Howard Taft, right? And we talked about Taft ascending to the presidency. And when Taft ascended to the presidency, he inherited um, a, a kind of simmering conflict within the Republican Party between the old guard in the Republican Party. And the old guard in the Republican Party were the laissez-faire, high-tariff, pro-business Republicans. 
and the progressives in the Republican Party, which were the people that thought that the power of government should be used to pursue human welfare and social equity, right? And how that Taft is torn over several issues as to what side to side with. And that eventually, when actually is forced to choose, he consistently sides with the old guard. And this generates a lot of consternation from the progressives and eventually Roosevelt himself, who challenges Taft for the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1912 because he contends that Taft had abandoned his original policies, his progressive notions. And remember that Roosevelt had really become certainly more progressive in his second term than in his first term. And when Roosevelt is unable to get the progress or to get the Republican nomination as a progressive Republican in 1912, he and the progressives bolt the party and they form the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party, and that party nominates Roosevelt. The significant thing is that Jane Adams placed Roosevelt's name into nomination in the Progressive. Who is Jane Adams? Two D's. Jane Adams, two D's. Yes, go ahead. Yes, she was the, um, the founder of the Hull House, which was a uh, settlement house. And Adams, obviously, would be significant in the progressive movement. Now, um, in the election of 1912, Roosevelt is going to face Woodrow Wilson. And he is going to face William Howard Taft. And he is going to face Eugene V. Debs. We made the argument that both Wilson and Roosevelt and Debs were various versions of progressivism. And all three of them had an approach to dealing with what was considered to be the biggest problem, and that was business, con business concentration or trust. Now, Roosevelt's approach was called the New Nationalism. At the core of the New Nationalism was this idea of regulating a powerful national government with a, tr a strong chief executive regulating business for the public good. Now, I mean, you know, many of you address that in your papers too. Is that conservative or liberal? And you could actually argue multiple things there. Um, Wilson, the new freedom, suggested that trust needed to be broken up and competition restored, restoring the new freedom, right? Debs wanted to nationalize the trust. He was a socialist. But all of them had an approach. Now, Roosevelt's new nationalism went beyond dealing with trust. You know, he pushed for social welfare, right? The welfare state, that the government needed to be an active agent for promoting human welfare by passing legislation, wage and hour bills, you know, um, you know, social, you know, social reform, you know, um, welfare payments and other things to protect workers, to protect orphans, widows, etc. Um, Wilson doesn't go that far in the new freedom, right? He doesn't go that far. What Wilson is going to attack is what he calls the triple wall of privilege. Now, in the election, there is no way that Roosevelt is going to overcome, you know, the division within the Republican Party. So Wilson is elected, uh, but not by a majority of the voters, like 42% of the people voted for Wilson, but he wins the electoral college. Once he takes office, right, Wilson is going to break with a lot of traditions. He's going to be a powerful chief executive that attacks the triple wall of privilege. You know, Wilson is going to address tariffs and push for lower tariffs. So what's the piece of legislation that was passed in 1913 that represented the first reduction in tariffs? since the Civil War. Does anyone besides Matt Davis and myself remember the name of that? Go ahead, Matt Davis. Underwood Tariff. The Underwood Tariff. The Underwood Tariff was significant because it, uh, or the Underwood Act, if, as it were, was significant because it reduced tariffs. It was also, uh, Cromkin, significant in another way. What was that, dear Cromkin? 
the first income tax? Yes, it provided for an income tax. To replace the revenue that would be lost with the tariff, an income tax was good. Oh, what amendment, Taylor, you are a student of constitutional amendments, what amendment um, allowed Congress to pass for a first time an income tax? The 16th Amendment. What was the 17th Amendment? Lillian, do you recall what the 17th Amendment was? the direct election of senators. Does anyone recall, Allison Perry, do you recall what the 18th Amendment was? We mentioned it today, dear Allison. What did she say? What did she say? Yes, prohibition. Anybody remember what the 19th Amendment was? Women's suffrage. Women's suffrage. The 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, the 18th Amendment, and the 19th Amendment are considered to be the progressive amendments. 16th Amendment was the income tax. 17th Amendment was the direct election of senators. Why was the direct election of senators considered to be a progressive reform? How was that so? Camden, this is the review session of your life right here. Go ahead. This is a hat trick. Isn't that an analogy from hockey? A hat trick. Maybe we'll throw our hats before you in this. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Well, don't throw it now, no. Um, it's because the city bosses that they can just put more than they want. Yes, because the, they, they may have, the, the bosses might have a, 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 an influence over the state legislature that would appoint senators. And this would give the people, well, no, I have to throw it at you. You don't throw it at me because it's right. Um, <laughs> Um, and so that, that's how the direct election of senators would make government more responsive to the people. And prohibition, temperance and prohibition, was a big part of progressivism. And the final culmination of the temperance movement, which was a big part of progressivism, comes with the 18th Amendment. And certainly the 19th Amendment, which enfranchised women for the first time, was a part of progressivism because the progressives thought that women would be better voters. They wouldn't vote for corrupt, you know, um, uh, bosses and their cronies and they wouldn't be influenced by alcohol and so all of those amendments in some manner or another are attempting to really enshrine progressivism in the Constitution. Yeah. Um, okay. Now besides the tariffs we, we also know that Wilson addressed banking with the Federal Reserve Act and you probably need to know that the Federal Reserve Act, you need to know, most of you seem to know this, you wrote about it in your papers, that the Federal Reserve System was the third bank of the United States, and it was different from the first two, in that it was a combination of public oversight, which was the Federal Reserve Board, and private influence work, which was the 12 regional banks. And it was a compromise between people that wanted a privately controlled bank and one that wanted a government controlled bank. So you should probably have a familiarity with that. Also, you should have a familiarity with the Clayton Act, and that's something that I didn't talk much about, but I want to reemphasize now the Clayton Act. The Clayton Antitrust Act was passed, I think, in 1914. And what it did is it outlawed certain business practices that were considered to be non-competitive. The Clayton Act embodied the new freedom. Okay, how are we going to deal with companies? We are going to make illegal the things that limit competition, like interlocking directorates or price discrimination. These things are what are the techniques that trusts use to control competition they're going to be illegal. Now, Samuel Gompers called the Clayton Act the Magna Carta of labor. Why? What did the Clayton Act also do that influenced labor? Does anyone besides Lillian and myself? Theodora, go ahead. Yes, the Clayton Act specifically said that labor unions were not a restraint of trade. Remember, under the Sherman Antitrust Act, restraining trade became illegal. That's how the government used the Sherman Antitrust Act to break the Pullman strike, because they said it was a restraint of trade. What the Clayton Act specifically said is no, labor unions are not a restraint of trade. They do not fall under antitrust legislation. 
Who was the first uh, 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 Jewish member of the Supreme Court? Who was the first Jewish member of the Supreme Court? Um, it is discussed as, as, as a part of Wilson's um, 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 actions late in his term. Anybody know? Anybody besides the instructor? Alec? For the people. <laughs> I should know, you should but I don't. Louis Brandeis. Louis Brandeis was the first um, Jewish member of the Supreme which was enormously controversial. It was enormously controversial that Wilson appointed him to the Supreme Court. Brandeis was a genuine progressive. So it was controversial on two levels. One, that he was Jewish, and the second, that he was such a, a genuine progressive. There is a question on the test about Wilson's actions in Mexico. So there's a little discussion about Wilson's foreign affairs in your book, and it talks about Wilson in Mexico, so you might want to take a look at that. And then we talk about World War I, all right? Now, World War I starts, Saba, when a Serbian freedom fighter, right, uh, when a Serbian freedom fighter, you know, assassinated the Archduke Ferdinand in the streets of Sarajevo, you know, and dramatically this sets forth a, a series of events that ends up with Europe being divided into two factions, the Central Powers and the Allied Powers. Who were the dominant allied powers? I'm going to put my finger up saying, go ahead, go down. Allies. Allies. England. Uh, was France said? Mm -hmm. US. Not at, Not at first. Russia. England, France, Russia. Central powers? Austria Hungary. Germany, good. Ottoman Empire, Turkey. Uh, um, what about Italy? Wasn't Italy historically aligned with Germany? Yes, they were, but they chose to go with the Allies in this because the Italian people are smart. They're a smart people, right? Um, so, anyways, it is the Central Powers versus the Allied Powers, and what is the United States' role? Remember, the, the World War One breaks out in July of. 1914, right? The United States does not enter into that conflict on the Allied side until April of 1917. So it's almost three years before the United States enters. In that three-year period, what was our policy, Kromka? Remain neutral. Neutrality. In thought and in action. Now, we don't end up being neutral. Why not? I mean, when we say our policy was neutrality, Taylor, the German, let's say this, at least the Germans don't think we're neutral. Why not? Because we're trading with the Allies. Far greater trade with the Allies, almost no trade with the Germany, loaning the Allies money, trading with them, selling them the things they need to fight the war. Why did, why did this happen? We, we wanted to be neutral, but what was the problem, Gail? This is the review session of your life. Go ahead. Yes. At the core of the problem is that the British controlled the sea. Right? And since they controlled the waterways, they were able to prevent us from trading with the Germans. And the result was that the Americans, although, although maybe not intentionally, were not neutral. What was the British response to the Americans' lack of neutrality, Boland? What was the big controversial response, Boland, that the, I should have said British, that the Germans, how did the Germans respond? to America's lack of neutrality. Submarine. Yes. Submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare. What did unrestricted submarine warfare mean? What did they do? Yeah, go ahead. That they wouldn't specifically target the U.S. ships, but they couldn't really tell which one was U.S. or Britain. So. And so they would sink what kind of ships? Um, merchant ships. And passenger ships. And what made it a problematic without what? Without warning. Without warning. Right? There was sink merchant ships and passenger ships without warning. And what was the most dramatic example of that? It, um, it was a good song. The Lusitania. The Lusitania, which was in 1915. What country? The Lusitania was a ship from what country, Odon? Son of Britain. 
It was a British ship. Right? And, and there were Americans on it. And it was sunk by a German submarine, and there was American loss of life. And in response to the sinking of the Lusitania, Wilson demanded that Germany stop this with such vigor that the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, resigned. Eventually, Wilson does get the Germans to agree to not sink neutral vessels or any vessels without warning. What's that called? What is the name of the pledge that he gets good about? The Sussex Pledge. The Sussex Pledge. And remember, the Sussex Pledge is going to be in 1960. What month do I have it there? March? Yeah. Is it March of 1960? So it sets the stage for the election of 1916 in which Wilson is going to run for re-election. Right? Wilson's going to run for re-election in 1916 and he almost is going to be defeated because Roosevelt returns to the Republican Party and supports um, um, Charles Evans Hughes, who is the governor of New York, who goes on to be the Secretary of State in the Harding administration, remember we, we, we said that, who's the, who's the presidential candidate, uh, and Hughes almost defeats Wilson. Wilson does two things. He prepares the country for war, he extracts the Sussex Pledge, and he turns left in terms of progressive reforms to attract progressives to the Democratic Party. Right? You know, but Wilson is reelected. And after he is reelected, you know, Wilson desperately tries to mediate World War I without success. So he articulates, you know, America's position. What do we want? What do we want to see happen with this war? We want this to be an end war to end all wars, a just and a lasting peace. But unfortunately, the Germans revoke the Sussex Pledge. Why does Germany revoke George? Why does Germany revoke the Sussex Pledge? I mean, this sets the stage for our entrance into the war, does it not? Germany says, look, we're going to sink any vessel in the war zone without warning, and if you don't like it, too bad. Why do they do that? Because they figured that by the time the U.S. could be prepared to end the war, they would have been able to essentially conquer France right George, you are saying that the Germans calculated they could defeat the Allies before the United States made an active impact into, their, into the military effort there. Yeah. And that they could prevent the United States from trading with the Allies and they could win before America made a difference. Yeah. Yes, and that's what they calculated. But it still took time for, for a formal war to be declared. The Zimmerman letter was important. Oh, what was the Zimmerman letter? Who was it? Cam, this is, this is unbelievable. This, this is phenomenal. This is like a Stradivarius. Go ahead. So it was a correspondence between Mexico and, and Germany, a proposed alliance between Mexico and Germany, which inflamed Americans. And you know, the Zimmerman letter and, and certainly the Russian Revolution and um, you know um, the, the Germans actually sinking our ships all contribute to Wilson eventually um, asking Congress for, for to declare war on Germany. What reason, what was the idealistic reason that Wilson gave? Why should we do this? Why should we fight the Germans? Why should we enter into this terrible war? Yes. To make the world safe for democracy. So he had to convince the American people that it was going to be worth it. That it was going to be more than just intervening in the sordid affairs of Europeans. Now, when Wilson, you know, leads the country into world war with this idealistic vision, he eventually says a lot of things about what we want, but he finally quantifies those things in the 14 points. You know, Wilson's vision for the peace are embodied in the 14 points, which are presented to the country and the world in January of 1918. Now, here's my fear. There are a few questions on the test about what happened domestically during the war. The war starts in April. It ends in November of 1818. So it's only 19 months. But during that time, the economy is, is supervised. 
there are you know, all sorts of things that happen that much of which we didn't talk about. What, so you, you want to take a peek at that. You know? One thing that we did talk about was the restriction of civil liberties. You know, and that was the Sedition Act, that was the Espionage Act. Who were the targets? You know, who were the targets of, 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 of some of the wrath? Who were the people that were arrested or? Yes. Eugene, Eugene V. Debs and the Germans, right? German nationals. Sometimes we would say the radicals, the union leaders, the socialists, they were the targets of the Espionage and Sedition Acts. And German Americans, who were considered to be potentially disloyal. Um, there's a discussion on the test about the draft, you know, which was passed in May of 1917, which enlisted almost four million people, although only two million of them actually got over to Europe and fought in, in World War One. You know, there were 133,000 casualties, in, you know, or deaths in World War One. Um, what role did the withdrawal of Russia have in the war? We said this is the big thing. Good, Kim. Yeah, that's why we got in, but once uh, the Bolshevik Revolution occurred in November of 17, how did that affect things? Gina, you are a, a student of the Bolshevik Re Revolution, are you not? Uh, how did that affect World War I, this Bolshevik Revolution, and the eventual Bolshevik withdrawal from the war? wonder what she said, Sam. I wonder what she said. <laughs> Oh, they published all, oh, so the Bolsheviks took over Russia, right? And they created the Soviet Socialist Republic, the first communist country in the world, which really throws everything into a tizzy. You know, what are they up to? It's a communist country. But they also published the Tsar's secret treaties with the other allies. And, and what, what was Wilson's response to the publication of the Tsar's secret treaties? We, we made mention of this. His response was the 14 points, right? He, no, 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 this is not, we're not part of that. This is what we want. Right? You want something different than our allies want. And that ends up being a, uh, a problem. Another thing that the, the Russian withdrawal does is it allows the Germans to concentrate all their troops on the West. That was the plan. We defeat the Russians, we cut off America's supplies, we focus on the West, we defeat the French before the Americans get there. Almost happens. The Germans almost pull this off, but not, not, not quite. Now remember, when the American forces make a difference in this war, you know, and they do, although it's at the tail end and it's only for several months, um, you know, um, the Germans are going to end up surrendering sort of agree to an armistice because they expect that they're going to get a peace arrangement that's going to be close to the 14 points. Wilson requires before such an arrangement can even begin that the Kaiser be um, you know, abdicate his power and that Germany basically agreed to an armistice, which they do. Now, we talked at length about what Wilson's challenge and we said that Wilson's challenge was to convince the other allies to accept a peace agreement that would look like the 14 points. And his challenge also was to get the United States to agree to participate in a League of Nations. And that Wilson believed that a League of Nations, a Parliament of Nations, was the solution to kind of the problem of international warfare. And he pushed for that and he got it. Right? It was a part of the Treaty of Versailles. Even though the Treaty of Versailles was widely criticized by lots of people as not really embodying Wilson's ideology, which it did not, at least the League of Nations was a part of it. Now, we talked about Wilson's tr struggle. What was the, what's the big reason why Wilson couldn't get it through? What would Wilson do? When he brought back the treaty from Europe, the, the Treaty of Versailles that included the League of Nations, presented it to the Senate, right? At this point, what is Wilson refusing to do that becomes a problem? Say it. Um, allow for change. Yes. He'll accept no further changes. And what did Lodge and others want to do? Alter it. And this became the issue. The Treaty of Versailles as it was, the League of Nations as it was, 
or the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations with alterations. Because Wilson would accept no changes in it, when it was um, presented with reservations by Lodge, Wilson ordered Democrats to vote it down. And vote it down, it went two times. The League of Nations, the Treaty of Versailles, failed to get to be ratified in November of 19 and in March of, of 20. In both cases, it was because there was not significant Republican and Democratic support. So Wilson fails to get the United States to agree to the Treaty of Versailles. And in response to its failure in March, Wilson calls the election of 1920 a solemn referendum. Right? The country can decide. If they vote for a Democrat, then they vote for the Treaty of Versailles. And we left you with Harding being overwhelmingly elected. All right. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for our test that we are going to have Monday. And it goes through the failure of the Treaty of Versailles to be ratified, Harding's election as an end of it. But Harding in office and the cultural conflict of the 1920s, all of that is on the next test. All right. That's going to be it for It's the class.